Have you ever heard of The Elf on the Shelf? It was a children's book released in 2005 that follows an elf who reports to Santa on who's been naughty or nice. Later on, they made it into a TV movie, and now it's a really popular game with kids around Christmas time. I'll never forget that elf. The one that terrorized me only a few weeks ago. I consider it a miracle I'm still here today to tell you about it. It all started the day after Thanksgiving, Black Friday. I had just gotten home with my family, mum, dad, and my five-year-old brother, Carson. We'd been shopping all morning, you know, waiting in lines trying to get the good deals, the whole thing. When we arrived home, I was the first one to open the door, and that's when I saw it. There, on the coffee table in our living room, was a bright, shiny red elf, just staring at me. I froze. That wasn't there when we left. How did it get there? I was pushed through the rest of the door by my brother, who saw the elf but with a much happier reaction. He ran to grab it when my mother came through the door and yelled, Carson, stop! My brother froze and looked back at her in confusion. I did as well. My mother hurried over to the elf and said, Now both of you sit down and listen very carefully. I was still confused as hell. What was she up to? Still not knowing, I complied and sat next to my brother on the carpet facing my mum. Now this here is a very special elf, one who must not be disrespected. She then bent over and picked up a book sitting next to the elf, opened the front cover and began to read. This is an elf on the shelf. He is a special scout elf who zips back and forth to the North Pole every night and reports to Santa on whether or not the children he is looking after have been naughty or nice. She went on. Once a family has adopted an elf, they must give it a name for it to receive its Christmas magic. Christmas magic? What a bunch of bull. I was 12 years old at the time and was well past my days of believing in Santa Claus or the Easter Bunny. I certainly now wasn't going to believe some stupid elf was going to come alive with Christmas magic. Each morning, the elf returns to his adopted family and is in a different place within the house, she continued. Sounds fun, doesn't it? I was way too old for this crap. I mean, seriously, who would believe this bullshit? And then looked at my brother who was rocking back and forth, cackling and clapping his hands with joy. My mother went on. Now there are only two simple rules that all children must follow with an elf in the house. First is that the elf can never be touched. If an elf is touched, it might lose its Christmas magic. Thus, it won't be able to fly back to the North Pole anymore. Second, an elf cannot speak or move in any way while anyone in the house is awake. Remember, an elf's job is to watch and listen. I seriously couldn't believe what I had just listened to. You expect me to believe this crap? I objected. James! She yelled at me. I was still looking at her with the same look a child might give when told he has to share his toys with his brother, which I hated. This is stupid. I'm too old for this. I said again, this time trying harder to get my point across. My mum walked into the kitchen and yelled behind her. James, come in here now. I followed her and when I arrived she grabbed my arm, bent over and looked me square in the eye. Now, you listen to me. You will not spoil this for your brother. If you don't want to participate, fine. But you better not say anything else about it not being real to Carson. Or so help me God, I'll make sure that Santa does not bring you any presents this year. I thought my mum was being completely ridiculous, but she genuinely frightened me. She always had a habit of doing that sometimes. I swear she liked Carson more than me. Anyway, I agreed, and it was settled. I ignored the elf, and let my brother bask in his ignorance. After our discussion, we went back into the living room. My mum asked my brother, So Carson, what should we name our elf? As quickly as my mum had asked her question, my brother blurted out, Zippy! Because he zips to the North Pole every night and talks to Santa and says if we've been naughty or nice. What a great name! Don't you agree, James? said my mum. Now you've given it its Christmas magic.
My brother clapped his hands again. Yay, Zippy! And so that was it. The thing that would come to terrorise me and haunt me still to this day in my sleep had a name. Zippy. A few days went by without incident. Every morning I awoke to the laughter and yelling of my younger brother as he ran through the house looking for that damn elf. Each morning he would be in a different place just as the book said, but I knew it was just my mother moving it around every night. One morning he was in the kitchen with one arm in the cookie jar and another morning he was in Carson's room, bent over in his toy chest, with his legs sticking out. I still thought the idea was nonsense, but I stuck to my promise I had made to my mother. Yes, I guess everything was fine with Zippy. That is until the first night when my nightmare started. It was late, and I was downstairs by myself watching TV. I started to hear a faint whisper coming from the other room. I brushed it off the first couple of times, but by the third time, I pressed mute on the remote, and I listened intently. I couldn't make out what it was, but it definitely sounded like a whisper. I decided to get up and have a look. I walked across the living room and into our dining room, where I heard the whisper coming from. I fumbled for the light, and when I switched it on, I almost shit myself. There, standing on the dining room table, was Zippy. His rosy red cheeks and bright, piercing blue eyes that were looking directly at me. That thing creeped the hell out of me. I figured my mum must have moved it in here earlier that night. I shrugged it off, turned around, and just before I killed the light, I heard a small thud. It hadn't startled me that much, and I turned around to see that Zippy had fallen off of the table and was now lying face down on the floor. I thought to myself, how the hell did that happen? I hadn't touched him or the table. He was standing though, so maybe his feet gave out from under him, I thought. I put the thought aside, went over to the table and bent over to pick him up. Just before I grabbed him, I remember what my mum had said about the first rule. Zippy can never be touched. I'm not sure how long I stood there, bent over thinking about that. This is just stupid, I thought. I don't believe in this damn game anyway. I got my senses together and grabbed the elf. As soon as I had touched him, bang, the light bulb above my head blew out and I almost dropped him. Standing there in the darkness, I suddenly felt very cold. The air around me had become freezing and unnatural. The TV from the other room was still on and barely illuminated the dining room. With the faint light from the other room cascading on the elf, I flipped him over and looked at his face. I stood there a moment in shock. I swear to God that his face had changed. Everything looked the same, except for his mouth. Zippy now appeared to be wearing a smirk, but not just any smirk. I can't quite explain it, but it looked evil. The kind of smirk a murderer wears when he's getting pure enjoyment from killing one of his victims. By that time it was late, and I thought maybe my imagination had gotten the better of me. Before I left, I remembered I was still holding Zippy. Shit, I thought. I didn't want to disobey my mother, so I carefully put Zippy back in the position he was standing in on the table and left the room. I went back to the living room and turned off the TV. I turned on the hall light and proceeded towards the stairs. In order to get to my stairs, you had to pass by the dining room. I started to walk by, not wanting to look at the thing, but for some reason, I felt compelled to. Just before the stairs, I turned and saw Zippy. This time, the hall light was shining on the part of the table where Zippy was, and there was no mistake. That fucking thing was smirking at me, with his blue eyes still piercing into my soul. I hurried upstairs quickly, cut the lights, and went to my room. I got in bed and pulled the covers tightly over my head. I don't know why, but I didn't sleep well that night. I knew that Zippy wasn't real and all of this was complete nonsense, yet for some reason, it still bothered me. I could not mistake what I saw that night. Still to this day, I see that damned smirk in my nightmares. I came downstairs the next morning, barely getting a wink of sleep. As I reached the bottom of the stairs, I peeked around the corner into the dining room. There he was, just as I had left him, with his face back to normal. 
My mum called me for breakfast, and as I ate, I ran through all the events that happened the previous night. Could I really have just imagined everything that went on? Impossible. I can't forget the smirk I saw on that little shit's face. It must have been real. Still doubting myself, I decided to keep what I saw to myself. My brother seemed to receive more and more enjoyment from Zippy each passing day, while I relented him in his stupid games. I hated everything about him. The way that my mother had continued to play with my sense of reality was not at all comforting either, yet Carson seemed to go right along with it. Then came the fucking notes. I guess my mother decided it would be a good idea if Zippy started to leave me and my brother notes around the house. Just dumb messages really, telling us to be good and that whole thing. The first one I saw was written out in M&M's and said, Be good, with Zippy sitting down next to my mother's creation, admiring it as did Carson in amazement. The next I found was, You better not pout, spelled in magnet letters on our refrigerator. This went on for about a week, until something changed. I'm not sure what kind of sick game my mother was up to, but the messages started getting very unsettling and downright creepy. I came downstairs one day and again saw that Zippy had spelled out another note in M&M's. I breezed over it at first, but on my second glance, I noticed something eerie. The message again began with be good, but it was followed by the words, or else. I figured my mother was trying to relay that message to me this time, and I must say it really pissed me off. I mean, it's dumb enough I have to go along with this, but to now have notes directed at me, saying stuff like, be good or else. What the hell was her problem? You can imagine my frustration with this. Later that night, I called her out on it, and her answer was simply puzzling. I asked her why she made that message for me. She gave me a funny look and replied, James, please, I don't know what you're talking about. I made a message like that a week ago, and haven't used Eminem since. I didn't believe her at first, but it was something the way she said it that seemed so convincing. Whatever, I thought. Just got to make it to Christmas, and then this dumb shit will be over with. The next morning, my parents took Carson to the doctors, and I was home alone. When I got up, I went downstairs and into the kitchen. I went to get a glass of milk, ignoring the letters on the door. I got my milk, and when I shut the door, I looked at the fridge and dropped it. Milk splattered all over the kitchen floor while I was staring at the fridge in sheer horror. The magnetized letter spelled out, You better watch out. At that point, I wondered whether or not my mother was aware of the fear she was causing me. I still thought she had made this one, along with the other disturbing message, but it was unlike her. I thought again to myself, There's no way that fucking elf could be doing this to me. I mean, that's not possible. I couldn't sleep that night. I just lay in my bed, staring at the ceiling. I was beginning to become very paranoid, not wanting to know what was coming next. What other warning I might receive? Was I going crazy? It was a question I pondered for a while lying there. But then I knew. It was about three in the morning. I was just falling asleep when I heard a sound from the hallway. I ignored it at first, but it came again and again and was really starting to scare me. I got up and slowly creaked open my door. I looked down the dark hallway and not a sound could be heard. I then noticed a thin slither of light protruding beneath the bathroom door down the hall. I figured it was nothing, but I saw shadows moving from the other side. I took a deep breath and walked down the hall on my tippy toes. I noticed that the door was slightly ajar with the light still on. No one was in there. Yet I felt compelled to look inside. I could feel a very cold chill coming from the room. I opened the door and turned my head to face the mirror. I still vividly see the image in my head. There, written in smeared toothpaste on the mirror, read, You better not cry. I'll show you why. I was frozen in horror, unable to move. I then looked to my left and saw Zippy in the hallway, just watching me. Quickly, I tried to run past him, but the rug from beneath my feet slipped out from under me. I tumbled backwards and fell hard onto the ground. I let out a shriek of pain as I clinched my leg. I turned it over and looked. A pair of scissors was sticking halfway out of my thigh. The pain was excruciating, 
I didn't know how it happened at first, but I'm certain now that Zippy had placed them there. My mum and dad came rushing into the bathroom, having been woken up by my blood-curdling screams. My dad got the first aid kit from the medicine cabinet after noticing the scissors driven into my leg. I looked up and saw that the mirror displayed nothing but smeared toothpaste. The message was gone and Zippy was nowhere to be found. I was rushed to the emergency room where they removed the scissors and gave me a tetanus shot. My parents asked me what happened. I told them it was Zippy but obviously they didn't believe me. My mum became very upset with me, saying that I'd broken the promise I'd made to her. The next night, I was lying in bed, unable to fall asleep. For one, my legs still hurt like hell, and two, I was watching my door, making sure that goddamn elf wouldn't get to me. I then knew I wasn't crazy. That fucking elf was trying to kill me. I eventually passed out several hours later from exhaustion. When I woke, it was still early morning. No one else was awake yet, and I didn't find a need to get out of bed. It was still pretty dark in my room. I shifted my gaze towards my desk, and that's when I saw him. Zippy was standing on my desk, looking at me with those hollow blue eyes, and wearing that undeniable smirk. I couldn't breathe when I saw him, and about crapped myself when I saw he was holding a note. I was still paralyzed by fear, but somehow my body was able to crawl out of bed and walk over to the desk. This time it was different. The note was handwritten. I looked, and I knew it wasn't either of my parents' handwriting. I held my breath, took the note out of his hand, and began to read. You've been very naughty. You cried when I said not to. Santa doesn't like that. I couldn't take it anymore. I took the note with me, walked down the hall, and kicked my parents' door open. My mum awoke suddenly, and I showed her the note. She became very upset, and the colour had drained from her face. After about a minute, I said, Mum, Zippy is not what you think he is. He's trying to kill me. I pleaded with her for a while, and yet she still didn't believe me. She did, however, become very concerned with my mental state. Later that day, she scheduled an appointment with me to talk to a psychiatrist. It didn't go well. She said that I was starved for attention, and that I was making up these stories about Zippy as a way of reaching out for a reaction. I argued with her, but to no use. After all was said and done, the psychiatrist suggested to my mother that it would be best for her to get rid of Zippy. I don't know how she did it, but my mother agreed. Later that day, she disposed of Zippy and had to tell a sob story to Carson. My mother said, Carson, you've been such a good boy that Zippy doesn't need to watch you anymore. His job is done, and he needs to go watch other kids and make sure they'll be good as well. My brother was upset, but seemed to understand. Everything returned to normal the next week. Zippy was gone, I was out of school for the holiday, and I finally started to get into the Christmas spirit. I thought now I could really enjoy Christmas, and my life will be back to normal. That's what I thought anyway, until Christmas Eve. It was night, and I was tired and anxious for morning to come. Carson and I just put out milk and cookies for Santa. Not that I believed in him, but it was fun nonetheless. At bedtime, I fell asleep rather quickly, thinking about my gifts and wondering if I would get everything I wanted. I awoke in the middle of the night to a noise. I lay there, silent trying to listen. It sounded like a whisper, coming from outside my door. I shivered. It was the same whisper I first heard from Zippy. I had nearly forgotten about him since my mother got rid of him. I got up and peeked out of my door. I heard that the whispering was coming from downstairs. I then became very curious. After all, it was Christmas Eve, and in the middle of the night I could hear whispering coming from downstairs. I thought it couldn't possibly be Santa, could it? I felt silly thinking such a thing, however it wouldn't hurt to check. A mistake I still regret. I slowly descended the stairs, anxious as to what I might find. I looked into the living room and couldn't see anything. I walked around to the table and looked to where I had left the milk and cookies. They were both partially gone. My mum must have done this after I went to bed. Everything seemed normal until I noticed a piece of paper under the plate which held the cookies. That's funny, I thought. I hadn't noticed that there before. I went over to the table and picked up the note. I turned it over and began to read. Dear James, 
You didn't think I'd forgotten about you. How could I forget about my favourite child? You see, James, you thought you had gotten rid of me. Your mother simply threw me in the trash. I can't go out that easily. You see, I've been watching you ever since you first saw me on the coffee table. Since you saw me crack that first smirk at you. All those messages no one else claims to have seen. They were all made by me. It was me, James, the one who watches your every move. I know what you're thinking, that your parents won't help you. No, they won't be able to reach you in time. You see, I'm in your house now, watching you panic as sweat runs down your neck. There's no escape from me. How does that old tune go? You better watch out. You better not cry. You better not pout. I'm telling you why. I'm why, James. I'm why. Sincerely, your pal, Zippy. My body shut down. I couldn't breathe. I gasped for air, but it couldn't reach my lungs. My legs felt like jelly. I was shaking uncontrollably. I dropped the note and darted out of the living room. I sprinted up the stairs, and right at the top step, I saw a toy train that I knew belonged to Carson. I couldn't stop myself in time. I tripped over the train and tumbled backwards, crashing down the stairs. I lay at the bottom, throbbing in pain, about to lose consciousness. Right before I blacked out, I looked up the flight of stairs. Behind the top post, I noticed the faint outline of Zippy, with a wide smirk on his face. I woke up the next morning in hospital. The doctor said I'd broken my right arm, one of my ribs and a leg. My family surrounded me and comforted me. We didn't make it to the part about how I fell down the stairs. Frankly, they were just happy I was still in one piece. After our brief chat, I said I would like some rest. My family agreed and left me be. This is where I tell this story to you now. A knock on the door. The nurse came in holding a gift-wrapped package and a card. Here, James, said the nurse. Someone left this for you in the waiting room. She placed the package and note on my bedside. I asked who it was from. The nurse replied, I'm not sure, just that I was told to make sure you had gotten it. She then turned around and left, leaving me alone with my gift. A present, maybe, I said out loud. I looked at the card. It was pretty bare and just said the words, Merry Christmas. I opened it and began to read. Dear James, I thought you might need some company while you're in here. You better watch out, because I'm always watching you.